the man whose property, whose land was very productive. But here's what he said. He said, I'll say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. They became careless. See, their prosperity, instead of being a blessing, became a curse. Because in their prosperity, they became careless and they forgot God. Let me tell you a little secret. When we forget God, we are on the path to disobedience. So they were proud, they were careless, and then they became selfish. Notice what the scripture said. She did not help the poor and needy. Now, when you thought about the sin of Sodom, is that the first thing that came to your mind? Selfish people. No, probably not. But I want to ask you this morning, is there a connection between the sin of Sodom and feeding the poor? There seems almost to be a progression here, doesn't it? A pride, carelessness, selfishness, abominations, and ultimately destruction. Pride comes before the fall. When we forget God, we disobey God. I don't know about you, but I couldn't help but think of the great nation that we live in today. We are the most prosperous nation in the history of mankind. If we are not careful, we can become careless and forget God. And when we become careless, we become selfish. And when we become selfish, we forget God. And we could be on the path to destruction. I thought about the church, not just Open Door Baptist Church, but Christians today. Are we like Sodom? Have we become proud and careless and forgetful? The Spirit of God in Revelation 3, 17 says, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy, speaking to the church at Laodicea, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Are we guilty of the sin of Sodom? If God holds a pagan nation accountable for neglecting the poor, what does he demand of his people? Turn with me to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 15. As I said, as you think about these, this, this issue of giving to the poor, you'll find scripture all the way through. Leviticus 25. I was reading all the way through. God's been, had the poor on his heart all the way. Leviticus, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7. If there's a poor man with you, one of your brothers, in any of your towns in your land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart nor close your hand from your poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need and whatever he lacks. Verse 9. Beware that there's no base thought in your heart, saying... The seventh year, the year of remission is near, and your eyes hostile toward your poor brother, and you give him nothing. Then he may cry to the Lord against you, and it will be a sin in you. You shall generously give to him, and your heart shall not be grieved when you give to him, because for this thing the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertakings. For the poor will never cease to be in the land. Who said that? Jesus said the same thing, didn't he? For the poor you always have with you. But that's a, a principle. For the poor you will, all, will never cease to be in the land. Therefore I command you, saying, you shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy and poor in your land. You say this morning, well, Brother Keith, that's an Old Testament. That's an Old Testament law. Did Jesus ever say anything about giving to the poor? Yeah. As a matter of fact, Jesus commands us to lay up treasures in heaven, not on earth. You know, when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, a man who was very wealthy, Jesus told him, go and sell all that you own. In Mark chapter 10, verse 21, he said, go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. So Jesus says the way we lay up treasure in heaven is by giving to the poor. This is not just an Old Testament principle. This is something that God is, is very near to the heart of God. In this passage, 
We see in Deuteronomy that the Jews were commanded to give to the poor man. How were they commanded to do that first? They were commanded to give liberally, to give liberally or generously. You shall not harden your heart nor close your hand from your poor brother, but you shall freely open your hand to him and shall generously lend him sufficient for his need and whatever he lacks. Verse 10, you shall generously give to him and your heart shall not be grieved when you do it. Verse 11, you shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy and poor in the land, in your land. In other words, they should be willing to lend to their brother, expecting nothing in return. Aha, you say, well, don't give it to him, just lend it to him. Look at verse 9. He said, you know, you need to do this willingly. Even if it's the year before the year of remission or the year of Jubilee. In other words, lend to him expecting nothing in return. We're commanded to give generously. As 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Jesus said, give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. We are to give generously. We're to give willingly. Secondly, we're commanded to give willingly. Beware that there's no base thought in your heart. Again, they could be thinking, if I make a loan to my poor neighbor, in the next year is the year of Jubilee. In the year of Jubilee, all debts were canceled. In the seventh year, all debts were canceled, or the year of remission. You know, the sixth year would be a great year to refinance your house. You could go to the bank and say, I need to borrow and refinance my house. And then the next year on the seventh year, all debts are canceled. But say you loan your brother $100. And then the next year, the year of Jubilee, all debts are canceled. He doesn't owe you a penny. So beware, God says, of a base thought in your heart. Beware of a, beware, the, like King James, beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart. See, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We're all thinking, I need to hang on to my stuff. I cannot afford to lend this to my poor brother. But God says, yes, you can. Yes, you can. You're to give to him generously. Open your hand. You're to give willingly without a second thought. Your heart shall not be grieved when you give it. You shall freely open your hand to your brother, to your needy and poor in the land. You know, I was thinking, why should we give willingly? I didn't put this in the outline, but let me just give you some reasons this morning why you need to be a giver. And not just a giver, not just a generous giver, but a willing giver. Why? First of all, God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. You know, that ought to be the end of the matter right there, shouldn't it? But scripture has a lot to say about giving. God loves a cheerful giver. We need to be willingly, give willingly because God has given so much to us. God has given so much to us. And let me just tell you a little secret about God and His relationship to His people. God's plan from the very beginning was to bless His people so that they might be a blessing to others. That's what He told Abraham. Through you, all the nations shall be blessed. Now what happened? The Jews are a classic example. They became prideful. They became careless. They became selfish. They said, we got God's blessing. Let's just keep it to ourselves." But God says, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. Like E.V. Hill, the great African-American preacher says, if God can get it through you, he will get it to you. So God has blessed us so much 